Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this MPTL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we start with a new text today having finished Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. So the new text today which we will start with is uh, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. And as some of you know this is part of the bigger collection of poems that Eliot published in 1917 called Prufrock and Other Observations which should be on the screen at the moment. Now before I dive into the text I just give a very brief background or the context which produced this poem in the sense that you know, it's a very modernist poem and it's important for us to know that Eliot is obviously coming to this poem from a certain tradition of writing and that the, the chief tradition that he's appropriating over here is a French symbolist tradition. So the influence of Malame, the influence of Baudelaire, the influence of all the French symbolist poets are very heavily present in Eliot's early poetry and those of you interested in Eliot would know that his poetry can be broadly divided into two different uh, kinds, almost like two different qualities, different genres of poetry. So his early poetry is very symbolic, it's very urban, it's very cinematic and um, we we'll talk about the cinematic quality, the visual cinematic quality um, in this particular poem as well and it's full of velocity and brokenness and fragmentation and very, very urban, very metropolitan. It, it contains the metropolitan madness and neurosis and also the metropolitan mysticism that you get a moment of epiphany uh, in certain very mundane conditions, how is an epiphany produced, generated an experience in a very mundane metropolitan condition. So Eliot's early poetry is full of those urban elements, urban uh, pointers. Now if you take a look at his later poetry, Poe's Wasteland, and we'll look at Wasteland as well in this particular course, we'll study that as a text. If you take a look at his later poems, let's say the four quartets, uh, you know, I mean, that, that, that kind of poetry is very, very spiritual, it's almost mystical, it's very far removed from this metropolitan velocity and madness and fragmentation. Rather, it's a poetry of reconciliation, of you know, a very, very passive spiritual surrender. And that has something to do with Eliot's personal orientation as a man as well, because, you know, some of you would know, uh, he was converted into Roman Catholicism, he became a Catholic in his later life. So his later poetry is very much part of the Catholic tradition of poetry and very religious and very spiritual. But this particular poem, uh, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, is one of the most famous poems Eliot ever wrote, uh, one, of the most, um, one of those poems that he's most known for. Uh, it's full of this metropolitan pointers, it's very, very visual, it's very cinematic, uh, it's very broken, it's very fragmented and it's very neurotic as well. And this neurosis is a very big element in Eliot's early poetry and uh, for that matter in much of modernist uh, narratives. So we saw, uh, like for instance, we just finished Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad and we saw how there's a very interesting relationship to be made there between neurosis and narrative and how uh, Marlowe's narrative is informed by his neurosis and so the, it's part of the neurotic problem as well that it, the fact that it can't really deliver a story and put that into a narrative, right? That becomes a problem for Marlowe. Now a similar kind of problem happens in Eliot's uh, early poetry as well, especially in this particular poem. The speaker, J. Alfred Prufrock, is a middle-aged uh, presumably bourgeois man who wants to frequent the very, very upper class social circles, but he can't really bring, he can't really get along with his story, he can't really tell you the story and at some point uh, he will tell you it's impossible to say just what I mean, it becomes a line in this particular poem. And again, his inability or the impossibility to just say what you mean is very much part of the modernist tradition and you know, you, if you take a look at a broader uh, you know, scenario over here, what's happening is uh, the poets and the writers are becoming increasingly aware of the inadequacy of language. In other words, the entire grammar of classic realism, the entire instrument, the entire machinery of classic realism is breaking up in modernism and they're looking for a different kind of expression, a different sort of vectors of expression which will be more befitting the emotional complexity. In other words, we don't really have the linguistic machinery to deliver the emotional entanglement and that's part of the modernist problem, uh, the, the problem of modernist literature and uh, what gets foregrounded over and over again is this inability to convey the emotional entanglement uh, in a particular linguistic machinery, right? So even here in J. Alfred Prufrock, the love song, you'll find it's not really a love song at all, it's an anti-love song. Uh, so in that sense, the deconstruction of the love song, uh, the typical idyllic love strong, uh, song has been deconstructed over here. 
But the more important uh, issue at hand is uh, the inability to find the right language for your emotional expression. So, the complexity of the emotional expression, the complexity of the human brain and the inadequacy of the artificial machinery of language to convey the complexity, the complex sensations of the human brain. That becomes a big part of the modernist problem and as a result of which we have so many techniques such as defamiliarization which we saw in Conrad, we have stream of consciousness which we see you know, rampantly in, in Joyce's Ulysses which we will study in this course and also Mrs. Jalloway by Virginia Woolf. Uh, so, that becomes a very big meta issue so to say in modernism ok and that is something which we have to bear in mind. So, this is a poem about fragmentation about the metropolitan uh, alienation is an alienation of man in a massive metropolis. The human subject is being isolated and completely alienated in a massive metropolis and that becomes a huge problem and that of obviously becomes very very existential in quality very quickly it becomes existential in quality right and that you know all this becomes part of the uh, crisis in this particular poem. Uh, so, the crisis is one of social crisis, he wants to mingle in a particular social circle which does not respect him, which does not uh, receive him warmly, uh, it disparages him, it uh, makes a jibes at him at his appearance. Uh, the problem is also linguistic, he does not find the right language to express himself and the problem ultimately becomes very very existential. So, it is a social alienation, there is a linguistic alienation, there is an existential alienation which is basically what this poem is all about right. And also, this poem is about procrastination, it is about uh, getting on to do something, but not really finishing it. Uh, the entire poem is about let us go, let us go and get in the circle, let us go and make the visit, let us go and talk to someone, let us go and speak to someone, let us go and mingle in a certain circle, but that visit is never materialized, that visit is never finished, that visit is never done. So, this half done quality, this undone quality in Eliot's early poetry is something which is very important for us to understand. And again, that becomes a large part of the metropolitan problem and it is about metropolitan madness, it is about velocity, it is about fragmentation, it is about alienation and it is also about procrastination. It is about not getting things done, it is about not finishing things right and this not finishing things becomes a very big important issue in Eliot's early poetry and that is something which we will look at very closely as well. There is an inertia quality about it as well. Okay. Now, before we begin this poem, there is a little epigram right at the beginning which actually I looked up for the first time today before I came to teach you. Uh, uh, I did not actually know what this was from, I always saw it, but I did not quite know what this was about. This is actually from Dante's Inferno and this is about a speaker in Dante's Inferno who is telling you uh, that you know I would speak, but no one would believe me. So, you know that is the result, this reason why I become this and you know, I come back from the dead but no one would listen to what I am saying, no one would believe what I am saying and as a result of which that gives me a sense of freedom right. So, this uh, uh, line in, in, in Italian actually this is from Dante's Inferno, this is what tr it translates into in English. The fact that the speaker is telling you that you know we I can tell you different things, I can tell you the horror images, the horror experience that I have experienced in Inferno, but no one is going to believe me, uh, no one will listen to me right and that gives me a sense of freedom, that gives me a sense of emancipation, that gives me a sense of agency ok. So, that is a very important quotation uh, an epigram with which this poem begins and, uh, and as you can see Eliot is very very clearly situating himself apropos of that Eurocentric tradition of writing, this European tradition of writing and we see that more rampantly in Wasteland, just full of allusions from Spencer's Fairy Queen, uh, from Dante's Inferno, from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, uh, it's full of different kinds of references or different kinds of European traditions of writing and Eliot is very much becoming a part of that European tradition. And again, uh, uh, it's important, it's worthwhile actually to bear in mind Eliot's personal proclivities over here. He is an American, uh, he came to Britain from America, uh, he is actually born in America, but he was very much trying, he is very hard, you know, he is trying very hard to appropriate the European British tradition of writing and that becomes, that shows quite clearly in his poetry as well. Ok, so let us dive into the poem The Love Song of Jill Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot and this is how it begins. I just read it the first chance and then we will start talking about it in some um, um, details. Let us go then you and I, when an evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go, through certain half deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent, to lead you to an overwhelming question, oh do not ask what is it, let us go and make our visit. In the room, the woman come and go, talking of Michelangelo. Now, at the very beginning, you find that this 
it starts with an invitation, a very dramatic invitation. Let us go, the new and I. Uh, it, it sounds romantic. Let us go, the evening is falling, uh, spread out against the sky. And the first two lines think, you know, will, will give an uh, image of idyllic romanticism. It's almost like a romantic poem, uh, beckoning someone to go out with you, beckoning, inviting someone warmly uh, in a romantic rhetoric to go out and take a walk as the evening is falling the sky, against the sky. But the very third line uh, has a medical metaphor, which is important for us to observe. Like a patient etherized upon a table, and we realize, we understand, we, we think, what is this image doing here? I mean, in an otherwise romantic beginning. Uh, so the evening, which is spread out against the sky, is basically like a patient etherized upon a table. And uh, this image of the patient spread across the table, etherized, numbed in a table, about to be operated. It also brings in mind uh, the medieval rack of torture. Uh, which was uh, which had a very similar structure, uh, by the way. Uh, the, the human subject was placed on that medieval rack and it was spread uh, across the rack in terms of torturing him, and, and the entire uh, instrument of torture would be then you know, operated on him. So, in both cases, the patient etherized upon a table as was a medieval rack of torture, we have the space of oppression. We have a space where the human subject's agency is completely annihilated. There's no agency at all, so to say. So the patient etherized upon a table, numbed in a table, and its entire image of numbness becomes important because what that conveys is a lack of feeling, uh, is a, in a complete uh, annihilation of feeling. And with that annihilation, with that depletion of feeling, obviously that is connected to a depletion of emotions, a depletion of agency. And we'll find that in more dramatic descriptions in uh, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, where the human subject is completely uh, bereft of emotions, right? And that, that loss of emotion becomes almost a cognitive crisis. And the cognitive crisis is very much there in Eliot's poetry as well. Uh, the, the fear, the crisis of cognition, the crisis of recognition and cognition is rampantly present in Eliot's early poetry. So that image of the patient etherized upon a table, numbed on a table, is very, very important for us to observe. And we'll come back to it and we find how that connects to the other narratives that this poem is offering us. Okay, let us go to a certain half deserted street. So, again, look at the halfness of Eliot's early poetry. It's half deserted, which is also say is half full, but it doesn't pick half full. He says half deserted. So, the sense of abandon, uh, abandonment uh, is very much there in Eliot's early poetry, especially in Prufrock. That, you know, there's an image of something being abandoned. There's an image of a space being abandoned, uh, a subject being abandoned. And that sense of being abandoned is very much there. And that's something which is a recurring uh, motif, so to say, in Eliot's early poetry. You know, this half deserted streets is a very crucial metaphor for that. Okay, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one night cheap hotels. So again, this whole image of the cheap hotel, the very seedy space of the cheap hotel is important for us to observe. Uh, and the hotel image is important because what we get is not a home image. It's not really an image of a home, of warmth, of stability, of uh, solidity. It's not that at all. Instead, it's an image of liminality, of frequency, of you know, recurring uh, visits, coming and going, uh, with no sense of uh, inhibition. And this uh, image of coming and going comes back in the end as well. But the, the fact that, look at the way in which that image of woman coming and going, talking to Michelangelo, is being prepared by the hotel image over here, the cheap hotels. So people just come in for one night, hey, often for some very dubious reasons, for some very, very dodgy reasons, right? So that image of one night cheap hotels, <coughs> which is also a very, very uh, <coughs> negative reflection of human relationships, uh, which is uh, fragmented, alienated, just debased uh, into some very, very basic, <coughs> excuse me, uh, into something uh, not very luxurious, not very fertile, not very rich at all. Uh, and that sense of uh, you know abandoned spaces, that sense of cheap spaces, that, that sense of being exhausted is very much there in this image of these one night cheap hotels, restless nights in one night cheap hotels. So again, uh, there's no peace at all. It's a complete anti-image of peace, right? So it's anti-peace, anti-tranquility, anti-fulfillment. Uh, and so what we have is fragmentation, alienation, isolation, and you know that becomes restless, and that restlessness is generated uh, out of that space, this one night cheap hotels, which is obviously an image of very seedy, dodgy activity, right? Not uh, rich or fulfilling human activity at all. And sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent. So again, the whole idea of tedious argument is not really a clever argument, it's not really a penetrating argument, it's a tedious argument. It knacks you, it exhausts you, it irritates you. Uh, it makes you nervous, it makes you irritated, right? Of insidious intent. So the intent is insidious, it in intent is something which is not benevolent at all, right? So 
Look at the way in which space and a human mind are connected to each other way. So, the street is you know compared to or described as a tedious argument, right. Uh, again, this is something which we find uh, very, very heavily present in Eliot's early poetry, which is to say the example of metaphysical uh, conceit, right. And if you look at uh, those of you who are aware of metaphysical poetry would know the poetry of John Donne, Andrew Marvel, they relied very heavily on this particular technique where two different uh, very disparate objects, very disparate entities will be compared. Uh, like for instance, John Donne in his poem, uh, uh, in his one particular poem about uh, two lovers, uh, he would say uh, the male lover would say to the female uh, subject that no matter how far I go away from you, we are like two hands of a compass. So, no matter how much stretch we are connected at one basic foundational uh, uh, point. So, again using something a mathematical instrument like compass to talk about human emotions, to talk about human love is something which is very shocking and that metaphysical conceit had a shocking effect, had a shock effect which is deliberately dramatized and conveyed to the reader. Now, we find something similar in Eliot's early poetry as well in a sense that we have this metaphysical conceits, we have this very disparate entities sort of almost violently put together uh, to defamiliarize the emotion and that act of defamiliarization is important because you saw that in uh, Conrad's Heart of Darkness and we see that now in more dramatic elements in Eliot's early poetry in the, in a space of poetry where defamiliarization actually has more of an effect on us. And even I mean poetry as a genre uh, so to say is about defamiliarization, right. It, it, it does something special to language. Uh, it changes language, it changes the, the arrangement of language, it changes the entire grammar of language and it makes language into something else, right. So, the way you consume language in poetry becomes very, very different from the way we consume let us say in a novel or in a short story, ok, generally speaking. So, and modernist poetry is all about defamiliarization, modernist poetry is all about making something strange, right. And you know, it is a very strange metaphor if you think about it. The street is being compared to an argument, a tedious argument, something which follows you all the time, a tedious argument which nags you, which does not let you go, which follows you, which sort of almost talks you. Uh, and that is the, the, the street over here, like the argument, is stalking you. So, it is like a stalker metaphor, which is used over here. But then that leads you to an overwhelming question and what is the question? Oh, do not ask what is it, let us go and make our visit, right. So, again there is a degree of procrastination over here, do not ask the question, do not ask what is it, no, it is a half complete question. Instead let us go and make our visit, right. In the room the woman come and go talking of Michelangelo. So, again the entire liminality, the movement of woman coming and going speaking of Michelangelo is something which is you know deliberately given to us. And now this particular scene if you if you visualize it is a very cinematic scene where woman coming and going talking of Michelangelo is obviously a very high culture space. It is a space of highbrow culture, very upper, upper class social circles where let us say very wealthy privileged people come and talk about art and culture and literature and painting and different kinds of uh, artistic activities which only the very privileged have access to, right. So, this reference to Michelangelo over here becomes a signifier of privilege, becomes a signifier of high culture and culture as consumed by privileged people. So, culture over here becomes an act of consumption, right. And in order to have access to that cultural space, uh, to that space in particular, we need to have the pointers of privilege, you need to wear the right kind of dress, you need to speak the right kind of language, you need to have the right kind of embodiment, right. So, embodiment becomes a very important uh, uh, issue in Eliot's early poetry and it is something I wanted to come to very early on. Now, what is embodiment? Embodiment is the process through which you nearly as well as discursively negotiate with your surroundings. That is the working definition of em embodiment for the purpose of this particular course. So, how do you nearly and cognitively negotiate with your environment, right? And also that, that cognitive neural negotiation also becomes discursive in quality. Let us say, for instance, if you use language as an example, the use of language at a very embedded level is neural and cognitive, right. So, that you, you can only use language to your brain, you can only use language to your body, to your nerves, to your senses. But at the same time, how you use language, what is the manner in which you speak, what is the manner in which you perform language, that is discursive in quality, right. That carries discursive markers. So, what is the kind of what is kind of metaphor that you are using, what is the kind of sophistication that you are using, is the language sophisticated, is the language advanced, is the language base uh, and that will obviously very quickly generate identity markers which are socially constructed. Like for instance, if someone is speaking in a very posh language which is very posh, sophisticated, advanced, full of lovely metaphors, to that usage of language becomes a marker of privilege, becomes a marker of prestige. Now, someone uses language in a different way uh, which is 
so to say, and not very sophisticated, which is very, very base, full of errors, um, is ridiculed. So that becomes, that user language then becomes a marker of just the opposite, lack of prestige, lack of sophistication, you know, something which is, uh, you know, underprivileged, for instance, you know, it's impoverished. So that informs embodiment in the sense that it, it informs how your identity is consumed in a discursive space. So identity making or identity formation is a neural cognitive embodied process and also equally is a discursive process. Now this particular space where a woman coming or talking to Michelangelo is a very, very sophisticated, posh, uh, in a privileged kind of a space where people come and talk about high art, high culture, uh, you know, certain kind of dresses, certain kind of fashions, is high couture. So it, it's all that kind of a space which is being represented over here. Now the male speaker in this particular poem, it desires to have access to that space and that desire is important because that desire is constantly frustrated, right? And as a result of which we see this constant procrastination on the part of the male speaker that, you know, he wants to go to the space, he wants to be the epicenter of attention, he wants to be the very much a part of that kind of conversation, a component of that conversation, but he can't because he can't bring himself along to perform the right kind of embodiment in order to have access to it, right? So that becomes a very much an embodiment problem. So among other things, Eliot's early poetry, especially the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, is about the crisis of embodiment, okay? And that's something which I want to emphasize very heavily at this point. Okay, now let's take a look at the second stanza and see how uh, we have this feline image uh, where the evening is like a cat, you know, the fog of the evening is like a cat which is licking its way across different spaces. And it's important for us to see how, again, uh, it's an example of metaphysical conceit where we have a very, very disparate entities brought together almost forcibly uh, to generate a certain kind of image, a certain kind of effect, so to say. So we saw already how uh, the street is compared to a very nagging argument which stalks you, nags you, irritates you, doesn't let you go. The street follows you in the same sense of being a stalker. And we have a similar kind of uh, metaphysical conceit coming up over here, where the yellow fog has been compared to something like a feline creature, something which is licking its tongue across different spaces. Let's see how Elliot uh, or the speaker represents it. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back that soothed the fallsome chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once above the house and fell asleep. So again, look at the way in which the evening, the fog, you know, it's supposed to have a tongue, it's supposed to, you know, walk around the, the terrace, uh, slipping in and out of the terrace, making a leap, uh, curling once above the house and then falling asleep. So again, it is a very, very organic metaphor. It's almost to say that fog has a life over here. It, it has a very animated image, it has an organic image. So, you know, the yellow fog is rubbing its back upon the window panes, like a cat would, right? The yellow smoke is rubbing its muzzle on the window panes. So again, the window panes becomes an important metaphor over here, and a window obviously represents uh, the house. But again, look at the way in which the, the houses are metonymically represented, which is to say that it's represented to certain fragments. And that again is very important uh, in part of the politics of representation in Ellis early poetry, the very, very interestingly metonymic quality that nothing is shown to you in a full fledged form. Everything is broken down into fragments and the, the body is broken down into hands, feet, uh, you know, fingers, uh, the houses are broken down into window panes, uh, half open doors, etc. So nothing is holistically uh, presented to you except in fragments. So that fragmented quality is very important for us to observe. Uh, and it, it licks its tongue uh, into the corners of the evening. Again, the fog, the smoke, which are, so to say, you know, they're not really organic entities at all, they're not really living beings at all, but they're supposedly uh, represented as uh, living beings. Lingered upon the pools that stand in drains. So again, look at the very cinematic image. It's almost like a close-up of a pool that is standing in the drain. So, you know, this very sordid, seedy, urban setting is described to us uh, in very, very uh, cinematic terms. It's almost like someone's moving with a movie camera and someone's giving you close-ups with a movie camera uh, and all these close-ups are forming a montage uh, which forms part of the Elliot, which part, forms part of the narrative over here. So it has this visual the grammar of a visual montage or the photo montage and this is important because in Elliot was heavily interested like other modernists uh, in, in, in cinema and a large part of modernism's anxiety uh, as well as aspiration was around cinema and it's, there's a different kind of research altogether to be had I'm not going to digress too much but suffice it to say that people like Elliot, Joyce, Wolfe uh, they had this very ambivalent attitude towards cinema 
uh, in a sense that they, they, they felt cinema to be some kind of threat. Uh, they were threatened to a certain extent by cinema because cinema to them had a certain kind of visual machinery, had a visual mechanism which would surpass language, they thought at that point in time. Uh, and they thought uh, cinema was very potent as a form of representation. But at the same time, uh, there was also an admiration towards cinema and with the admiration came a degree of appropriation. So you find over here, uh, Elliot is using heavily the, the grammar of the photo montage in a sense that we have a sense that uh, someone's moving with a movie camera in hand uh, and capturing everything around him uh, and giving images and little montage elements, very metonymic images of an evening spreading across a very, very sordid and seedy urban setting, right? And that is depicted to you using the images of chimneys, drains, window panes, yellow fog, yellow smoke, uh, broken terraces uh, and, you know, obviously before that uh, we have the image of this one night cheap hotels. So the visual politics, the visual setting which is generated out of this particular description is one of despair, one of brokenness, one of alienation, which is a very, very metropolitan phenomena, especially depicted in modernism, right? So this becomes very much a part of modernity, right? The, the you know, and there's a lot of work done uh, uh, comparing the metropolis and uh, the human psyche. One magnificent work is Josh Simmel's book called The Metropolis and Mental Life, which is something I heavily recommend if you want to do go deeper into that kind of research. That's one book I recommend very, very heavily. Josh Simmel's, uh, you know, uh, the modernity, metropolis and the modern life and mental life, right? So that's something which you can read up and that's something which informs directly this kind of depiction that uh, we see in Elliot's early poetry. So just to come back to this particular stanza, the yellow fog, the yellow smoke are described as feline creatures, uh, you know, organic creatures who are lurking around the house, licking the tongue, uh, licking with the tongue the window panes, curling around uh, the window panes and then, you know, rubbing the back in the window panes and then, you know, once uh, seeing that it's soft October night, uh, falling asleep by the window panes on the terrace, okay? So the movements are very organic, the movements are very, very jerky. So again, this is, has a very, very camera-like quality to it, uh, the very jerky handheld movement. And I'm thinking of Vertov's film Man with a Movie Camera, which was, uh, you know, which is very, very famous at that point in time. And maybe Elliot was aware of it and Elliot was definitely aware of the Lumiere. Uh, Elliot was definitely aware of the different kind of cinematic movements happening at that point in time. Elliot was definitely aware of Chaplin, Charlie Chaplin. Again, one good book to read if you're interested in, in the relationship between cinema and modernism is David Trotter's book called uh, Modernism and Cinema. And that's something we should read if you're interested in that kind of research. But suffice it to say, uh, Elliot's early poetry, especially proof work, is full of cinematic movements, it's full of camera movements and the visual narrative generated in this particular poem is very, very cinematic and uh, camera-like in quality. <clears throat> okay, so let's come to the next stanza. And indeed there will, there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street rubbing his back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room the woman come and go, talking of Michelangelo. So I'll stop at this point, but I'll just go back and reread this and see how this becomes a very good example of existential crisis, which is uh, informed by uh, you know, a cognitive crisis, uh, informed by something very, very artificial. So the, the whole image of time coming back, uh, there will be time, there will be time for the yellow smog that slides along the street rubbing us back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face, to meet the faces that you meet. So that is to say, the entire performative quality of embodiment. So you have to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet, right? So, you know, in, in other words, uh, human meetings or human encounters are very performative in quality. And again, that becomes part of the artificial mechanism of modernity. The fact that, you know, every movement, every meeting, every encounter is artificial and performative in quality and that obviously makes the human subject neurotic, right? This constant compulsion uh, to perform, this constant compulsion to carry out encounters, carry out meetings which are performative, which are perfect, uh, that creates, that generates a degree of neurosis which is something which the speaker is talking about over here. There will be time to murder and create. So again, look at the way in which murder and create, two contrasting adjectives, two contrasting verbs, sorry, are put together, juxtaposed together to create this attitude of ambivalence, right? So you can murder something, you can kill something, you can decimate something and also create something. So murdering and creating go hand in hand in this kind of existence. 
and time for all the works and days of hands the lift and drop a question on your plate. So again, look at the way in which something as abstract as question is materialized over here. It has a very solid material signifier, something which can be dropped on your plate, right? Something which is palpable, something which can be held, something which is tactile in quality. And again, this is something that I want to talk a little bit about, especially in the next lecture. The very synesthetic quality in Eliot's early poetry. Now, what is synesthetic? What is synesthesia? Synesthesia is that condition, that cognitive condition where your normal sense of normal awareness of things get crisscrossed. Like for instance, what you can normally smell can also be felt, can also be touched. What you can normally hear can also be smelt. What you can normally see can also be touched. So again, it is basically a crisscross of different cognitive conditions, right? So that, that very complex cognitive condition which can sometimes be medical, which can sometimes be spiritual, that is called synesthesia. Now synesthesia is very much there in Eliot's early poetry. Now you can see over here, uh, in a time and question which are very abstract categories, they are actually seen as something which is tactile in quality, something which you can touch, something which can palpably be presented. So uh, you know, question can be dropped on a particular plate, on your plate. Time for you and time for me <coughs> and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. Now again look at the way in which Eliot's poetry also has a bathetic quality. Now what is bathos? Bathos is anticlimax. So it is gearing up for something momentous, for something profound and then it ends with something which is completely non-profound, something which is almost flippant in quality. And you know obviously one of Eliot's very famous line is it starts with a bang but ends with a whimper, right, which is from Hall of Men. So it always ends with a whimper. So you have the spiritual metaphors coming in, condensing together to create something and prepare you uh, as a reader for something spiritual and deep and profound. And then we get this image of taking of a toast and tea, which is the most banal uh, daily activity, right? But the point is, and that's the important thing in Eliot's early poetry, that it actually combines the banal and the profound together and does not look at profound as something which is out there. The profound is something which is embedded in banality, right. So banality and profundity go hand in hand in Eliot's early poetry, right. And the whole image of time away is important because that is something which will keep coming back in Eliot's early poetry, especially in proof of. Now there are two kinds of time in Eliot's poetry and especially in modernism. If you look, take a look at even in Heart of Darkness, especially we will see in Mrs. Dalloway and Joyce's Ulysses, there are two kinds of time which are represented in this kind of narratives. One is clock time, standard time, digitized time, something which can be uh, shared and measured and quantified. The other is psychological time, something which you inhabit through your senses, something which you inhabit spiritually, existentially, emotionally. Now clock time and psychological time may or may not conform together, may or may not be you know, you know, in conformity with each other, it can be completely in sync as well as out of sync, right. Now what is happening over here when Eliot is saying, when the speaker is saying there will be time, there will be time and then of course it comes back to a very banal thing. Uh, it is a very, very interesting uh, montage of different narratives of time and it is a very interesting montage of clock time and psychological time. And the philosopher that is um, these people heavily borrowed on is someone called Henri Bergson. B R G S O N, the French philosopher on time, and that's something which Eliot is obviously heavily influenced by over here, right? So when he's saying there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces of the meet, which is very spiritual and psychological and existential, and then it all comes back uh, and into the whole idea of taking of a toast and a tea. Now before that, there's an image of hundred indecisions, which is obviously part of the procrastination package in, in, in this particular poem. Everything is getting procrastinated, getting delayed, uh, getting half done. So the sense of being delayed, the sense of being you know temporarily complicated is something which we see a way up. And of course, it is it, it contains a hundred visions and revision. So every vision is followed by a revision, and it all cuts back then into this very banal image of taking toast and tea, right? So the banality and the profundity they go hand in hand over there in very interesting cognitive ways. And again, we have the recurring motif, uh, the recurrence of the line in the room, the woman come and go, talking of Michelangelo, right? So again, this whole idea of the woman coming and going, leaving, you know, entering and departing, talking of Michelangelo is obviously uh, is, it, it suggests a very super official kind of uh, space where p people come and talk about certain pointers of privilege. Uh, speaking of Michelangelo uh, will generate a certain kind of identity about you, right? And it's a woman coming and going, obviously, it's a very privileged set of people as I mentioned already, talking about something very, very privileged, something very, very high culture in that particular room in which this particular speaker aspires to go to, but he cannot bring himself to reach there, okay? And the whole poem is about wanting or desiring to go to that particular space, wanting or desiring to be accepted in that particular space and failing to do so, right? So the entire poem is about the failure 
uh, or being accepted, the failure to narrate, the failure to talk about what is actually going on in your mind. In that sense, it's very interestingly connected and can be related to Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, where to we have a speaker coming back from a, a non-European setting, having experienced something horrifying, something having experienced something which is momentous, but it cannot bring him so to actually tell what happened to him, to European audience, right? Because he won't be accepted and received and understood over there at all. So like Heart of Darkness, this particular poem is also about incomprehensibility. It's also about the failure of communication. It's all also about the cognitive crisis, which then becomes a communication crisis, which then becomes an embodiment crisis, right? So that becomes part of the sequence of crisis in Eliot's early poetry, as we can see also in Heart of Darkness. So I'll stop at this point today and I continue with this in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.